are live. Um, I have to, of course, now move my uh, move my screen around because I put it right in a position that I cannot get with my mouse. <laughs> <laughs> I put it right between my two monitors, and I'm like, I can't see anybody. Um, okay, there we go. Cool. So we're, we've got participants starting to roll in. Um, we're going to wait just a couple of minutes till everybody rolls in until we get exactly started. But to those of you that are here, Welcome. I hope that you're doing well. I hope that you're enjoying your Friday. You're getting a little break in this Friday lunch break right now. Um, but welcome to uh, another one of our Fall Fossil Fun programs. Um, this is actually going to be our last program, at least for this year. Um, if you guys haven't tuned into any of the other ones yet, we've been doing a whole series of them um, all about just fun fossil things um, in place of usually um, we have an in-person event that's called uh, National Fossil Day. Um, and also an in-person event called the MSU Dinosaur Dash. Um, of course, due to circumstances, those were both not allowed to be in person this year. Um, so we did a bunch of virtual things instead, um, including webinars like this one. Um, so we're very excited to be, uh, today to be joined by uh, Jay Artemis Hall. Um, we're gonna be doing some great things with fossil poetry. And it looks like our numbers have about leveled off here. Um, so uh, just a couple of housekeeping things for you guys. Um, if you have used Zoom webinars before and you need a little refresher, or if you've never used them before, um, we're going to be using a couple of different features of Zoom webinar today. Um, I will be kind of moderating the chat and moderating any questions. So if you guys have any questions for Jay that you want to uh, leave, then you can use that in the Q&A box. Um, you can also just generally chat in the chat box, um, and we might be asking just like some open-ended questions or some thoughts. You can leave those things in the chat box as well. Um, it's always great to hear where people are coming from and maybe what your names are. So if you're comfortable with that, you can feel free to put that in the chat, uh, maybe what city you're coming from or um, any information you want to tell about yourself to kind of introduce yourself in the chat. Um, I can start. My name is Nick. I'm an educator at the MSC Museum, um, and I'm currently in Jackson, Michigan. Um, but yeah, we're very excited to uh, be doing this program today with Jay, all about fossil poetry. So we can get started. Um, I'm going to introduce Jay a little bit for those of you who uh, might not be familiar with their work. Um, Jay has worked with the museum on a lot of different stuff um, and or just created really, really fantastic, cool things that we'll be talking about today. Um, but Jay Artemis Hall is a non-binary poet with an affinity for rocks, birds, and tabletop role-playing games. Um, the work has found a home in a handful of literary journals, as well as engraved in the sidewalk, uh, arranged to accompany the MSU Museum's Hall of Evolution, and shouted across Grand River Avenue. Um, and we're really excited to have Jay here with us. So Jay, welcome. How are you doing? Hi, I'm, I'm doing well. I am excited about this. Uh, oh, hello, Aram. I see the chat here. And hello, Madeline. I'm, I'm excited to, to have people here. Uh, so how this presentation is laid out is I have my 15 minute little talk about some poems and some interesting fossils that the poems are about. Uh, and then a challenge at the end. And then the rest of the time is open for discussion and questions and such. So with that, is there any questions or stuff before I get started? I'm going to take this slight silence as a no. Uh, so I'm going to start with a poem that is not my own. Uh, it actually came to me uh, via the Poem of the Day newsletter I'm subscribed to a couple days after I got asked to do this talk. Uh, the title is Archaeopteryx which is a um, uh, feathered dinosaur that for a long time people thought it was like the missing link between dinosaurs and then birds. Uh, it can fly because it's asymmetrical feathers, uh, asymmetrical flight feathers, as well as a broad tail. Um, since then, it's probably not the missing link. It's probably a more dinosaur-like ancestor of those links, but it's still very cool. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen so that you can see this poem as well. There we are. Uh, so this is Archaeopteryx by Cajusitz and Nevicus. You're home, eating lentils, talking to your loved ones. You're abroad, eating lentils, talking to your loved one. You're not yourself, you've been stolen. You're talking to your lentils. You're not a knife, not cotton. Talking to your loved one. 
You forgot how to talk and forgot how to hang in the closet. You forgot the letter P in the receipt. You're talking to Cotton. It doesn't answer. Its life was not for you. A lot, too much, although there is never too much. You're anywhere, eating lentils, talking to. She doesn't answer. She went everywhere you went. She went, she flew. When you fly, you can't cry. You're talking to her. She doesn't answer, but there were two rooms. You didn't know where. You went anywhere. No one was drawing your loved one there, just a manuscript in the bottom drawer of the desk, and its feathers are petrified, along with two dozen of its vertebrae. You, you told your loved one about this. You ate lentils, and it didn't even rain. 150 million years, just the blink of the eye, in your manuscript, in this in Schollenhofen schist. So I really enjoy this poem for the, the fracturedness of it, as well as hinting at like that heaviness and that weight of history that comes with studying fossils and Earth's history in general. Um, when when people one of the things that people say about like creative work, like poetry, is that it gives you uh, a different way about thinking about things. Uh, but I would agree argue that like science does as well. Um, don't tell my geology 201 professor, but I definitely started several poems in his class just because learning and thinking about the Earth's history and things as simple as table salt is often like the condensed condensed essence of an ancient ocean just throws things into such a disorienting perspective uh, that it's just really fascinating. <laughs> uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Uh, so as Nick mentioned, I mentioned, uh, or as Nick mentioned, I did a book of poems for the museum uh, going through their hall of evolution and picking out uh, specimens that were interesting and to write poems about. Uh, while I was doing that, I spent several afternoons in the Hall of Evolution just learning and experiencing and also having intense emotions. I have cried in the basement of the museum. <laughs> um, I'm going to share uh, another poem right off the bat here. Uh, it regards to that, that weight of history and science opens up so many new avenues to think about your creative work. And I think creative work also is really integral to science. So, sorry, I'm sharing my screen again here. <laughs> and pop over. Ooh. There we are. So this uh, is how to kill a cockroach. Um, cockroaches evolved, um, when, when they evolved like 320 million years ago, they have not changed much since then. Uh, here we go. How to kill a cockroach. One, ready your preferred weapon. Shoe, newspaper, take your pick. Two, fix your target in your sights. Calculate all the ways those little legs could run. Three, realize it's great, great, Great to the power of 20, great grandparents looked the same. Four, catch yourself wrapped in history. Catch the bug in a cup instead. Five, avoid flinching. Remind yourself that this skittering is the same sound its ancestors made. Six, let it go outside. For added emotion, envision the giant dragonflies it used to exist with. Seven, Wonder how many descendants there will be in another 320 million years. Eight, will these future babies look the same? Will your children make the same choice? So uh, I shared that one and I'm sharing these because I really do think like science and art are way more similar than people give them credit for. Um, as human beings, we are both creative and analytical. Our brains are wired for pattern seeking and for community and sharing. Um, so as, as just like human beings, we have all these aspects of ourselves. Um, and 
scientists have to be creative to figure out how these things put together and artists and poets need to be analytical to learn and absorb and edit their pieces. And I think it's, I think it's a disservice to put them in their separate boxes um, because we are all using different parts of our brain for all of these things. Uh, I'm also a big fan of bridging this divide uh, because taking breaks to use different parts of your brain is really helpful. Uh, I'm in graduate school right now for library science, and I've been taking breaks from the heavy absorbing and learning of school and my analytical poetry uh, and emotional work of poetry by uh, listening to sea shanties and the, doing the meditative work of crochet. Uh, and also, I'm a big believer in the fact that poetry and science really don't have to be serious all the time. Um, so with that, uh, this next poem that I'm going to do is also from the Fossil Poems booklet. Uh, I was, when making this booklet, I was drawn to some fossils because of their scientific interest and like importance, and some of them because they made me feel really powerfully. Um, this next one I was drawn to because it was cute. <laughs> um, this is uh, Luxopteryx is, um, I'm going to pull up a picture of it in a moment, but it's a very raccoon looking mammal. Uh, but it actually is not at all related to raccoons. Uh, it's actually much closer related to horses, uh, which I found was fascinating that that little creature could go so extremes. Uh, around the same time it developed um, or it evolved, uh, opossums also uh, started being present, and opossums haven't changed really much at all since they evolved. But this little guy has. So I'm gonna share my screen again so you can see a picture of this, um, this little guy. Uh, this is a uh, limerick for Luxoplus. <laughs> Goodness. And uh, this painting that you can see here uh, is on the walls of the MSU Museum's Hall of Evolution. And here he is. There once was a mammal that changed course, and it took the Cenozoic by force. It looked like the raccoon, it would be here quite soon, but it was really the dad of a horse. <laughs> Which is just, I don't know, short, simple, fun. Um, and again, I think, I think it's important to have fun in, in your work and your creative, because what else are we doing this for? <laughs> I want to mostly let you obviously like, continue doing this, Jay, but I just want to say that's one of my favorite poems that I've ever read of all time. And any time that I'm down in the museum, if you guys see this painting in the Hall of Evolution, uh, Loxolophus um, is just kind of a tiny little painting down in the corner of um, one of our bigger expanses of paintings by John Hope. And so it's not something that sticks out immediately, but almost anybody I'm down there with, I always point it out. And I'm like, you will not believe this great fact that I have about this thing because of this poem. And so poetry is just a really great way to teach people too. So it's just, it's just really fun. I wanted to throw that in. Thank you for jumping in on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. <laughs> Cause it's, I don't know, the, the fun ones to write are always the ones that are exciting. And, and yeah, like, again, like just noticing, the art of noticing, I think is also really prevalent in, in science and poetry. Um, I'm kind of winding down my end of my 15 minutes uh, here. Uh, I'm going to, give you guys uh, a prompt. It's usually when I do workshops, I would give you a prompt and we would write uh, and then we would share. It's a little awkward to sit in a Zoom meeting uh, quietly uh, while we're all writing. So uh, instead, I'm gonna give you this challenge uh, and over the next couple days or week or however, um, just be aware of what you're seeing and something that is fascinating to you or something that just really strikes you as interesting that you want to learn more about. Um, it could be maybe your study area um, if you wanted to do that and like share with this really exciting fact. It could be a passing quote that you see or a news article. Um, you could be like me uh, and go to the National Fossil Day Art Contest page um, and they have little descriptions of several Paleozoic creatures uh, and that I, I looked through and found one. I was like, oh, that seems really interesting. I want to do more research on it. Um, this is really intentionally open-ended. It's literally the prompt is just find something that 
sparks interest and research it and write a poem with that as the catalyst. Uh, there's lots of room to play. It could be very much like the creature, like my limerick, or it could just, the creature could be just like a catalyst for a different emotion, kind of like the Archaeopteryx poem that I shared. Uh, so the last poem I'm going to share with you uh, in this part of the presentation is the one that I did for my, I gave myself this prompt. Uh, like I said, I looked at the Paleozoic creatures that the National Fossil Day Art Contest had, um, and I uh, chose Tiktaalik, which is um, a genus of creatures that may have been the missing link between the lobed fin fishes of that era and uh, the tetrapod, the four-legged animals that it would um, come on land. Uh, this creature is interesting because while it is definitively a fish, uh, it also has really, really sturdy shoulders. Um, it has some things that are look kind of like wrists, uh, as well as a neck, which are not really things that most fish have. Um, it also may have had lungs in addition to its gills. Uh, before I share this one, I'm usually like a no disclaimers poet, um, but in this somewhat scientific concept, I do have two disclaimers. Um, first, about Tiktaalik, um, it is a contender for like the missing link. There has been some controversy over whether it is definitively that one, because there has been, you know, fishes that prop themselves up before and after it, and it's it's a contender. Uh, I picked it because it is to my knowledge, like one of the most famous or well-known contenders for that missing link status. Um, the second disclaimer is about the poem itself um, in the spirit of this prompt of just finding something, creating about it. This was entirely researched, written, and edited within the span of a couple hours. Um, with that, I'm gonna share my screen again for you. Uh, uh, this is the prompt. I'm going to share the slide deck in the chat with y'all afterwards so that you can have like these links and these prompts. Uh, here is uh, talking behind Tiktaalik's back. Tiktaalik was a sad excuse for a fish. Shoulders too muscular, snout weirdly long, an unwieldy swimmer in the words of a scientist, which of course we need to take. The weight of history resting on a fish slowly becoming worse at swimming as it finds ways to prop itself up and breathe air. How different our world and cells would be if it wasn't Tick the Lick who crawled into new territory, if it was someone else with a whole different set of skills. How different if you had dropped out of college or talked to that person, took that job offer. But in this version, a poor swimmer's unwieldy fins slowly turn into legs its gills into ears, bones stiffening and strengthening to support weight on land. I'm gonna be a librarian, probably. I live with a cat. We deal with what we're given, possibilities closing and opening at each choice. And there's this little cute guy here. Um, I don't know, I found him very interesting and now I know quite a bit more about him. <laughs> so, that is the end of my presentation. Um, I'm going to throw into the chat, and then I'll also share my screen, uh, my contact information, as well as the uh, museum education team's email. Um, because if you do take this prompt, uh, the museum and I would love to see what you create uh, and possibly share it on social. Uh, I also have the link to these slides if you want to go back to any of these poems or have that link to the uh, Fossil Day uh, art page. <laughs> Give me a second to find those links here. So, um, as I am doing this, uh, you can be, feel free to be thinking about <laughs> questions or comments about these poems, about creative processes, about, and that Melba science, I also am really interested in you in other people sharing like their creative processes or their how they meld these two things here. So, yeah, and we actually already have a couple of questions that have rolled in. Oh, so awesome! If, if you want to, I can start off with those. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, the first question came in from Madeline. It was uh, pretty early in the presentation. And um, they asked uh, if uh, you could do the order vision, um, which I uh, asked if they meant the, the period or if there's a specific poem about the order vision. Um, and they said, yes. Um, so I take that to mean, yes, order vision is awesome. Um, so I don't know if you have any just general thoughts about the order vision, or I did look up to see if there were any poems about the order vision, and I did find one called order vision fossil algae, and I could put a link to that in the chat if you want oh. that. Um, looks like it's it's from uh, the finchandkey.com Sunday science poems, which I haven't found before, I haven't seen before but is a very cool thing, it seems to be. So I'm going to spend a lot of time reading these. Oh, this is exciting. OK. And one of my favorite things about the combination of science and poetry is that there's a lot of connections between it, like, like Jay was saying, that, um, yeah, there's just lots of ways that they can be connected. And so a lot of scientists, you'll find out, do like to write poetry. And a lot of poets can be inspired by science. So if there's a specific type of science that you're interested in or a particular fossil, you usually can look up and just, you know, Google something like Tiktaalik poem or, you know, almost anything. Um, and then you're you're able to find cool stuff like like this one that I was just able to find looking it up. Awesome. I am reading this this poem that you sent. That's this, this is fun. Um, wow, that's exciting. <laughs> I I don't think I personally have any poems about this particular period right now, but I love this one and high key could read it if people you if other people want now? to hear this. Yeah, let me share my screen so everyone else can follow along. All right, so the Artifician Fossil Algae. This is the oldest book that I can read with pleasure. The Cambrian trilobite is an unpleasant sight. As for Precambrian algae, I look and look and cannot see them, though I'm told they're there. But these exquisite fern-like forms printed on the rock these fragile plants have survived the storms of some odd billion years, move me almost to tears. So I come here often to see these delicate stems breathed on the rock like frost crystals on a window, but permanently, forever. This rock is my favorite book, my favorite picture, my dependable scripture, my sense of wholeness a billion years at my elbow. That's really fun. That's great. Yeah. And then we've got a couple more questions that have rolled in too. Um, awesome. So um, Aram says, could you share tips for observing that I could use with young writers? I may be able to bring them to the museum, which would be awesome, Aram. And we would love to have you. I see that you had left a message too that you were leading uh, writing camps with Spartan Writing Camp and the Red Cedar Writing Project. Normally, um, we always love having the Spartan Writing Camps come to the museum um, anytime that they get the chance. So um, you can feel free to connect with us and we'd be happy to set something up again when things get back to normal um, or if you want to do something virtually would be super cool. Yeah, that's super exciting. Uh, and thank you for the, the question and the sharing, Aram. Um, I have two things that immediately came to mind. Um, one is uh, a workshop that I did with Gabriella Corva Caressi. Um, they, what they had us all do at the start of the workshop was we had to go around and say something we have seen today that no one else has seen. Uh, and so it's really, I really love that exercise because it made me think, oh, wow, there is so many little mundane moments that I need to pay attention to because, you know, it's hard to think of like, what has no one in the history of the world ever seen except for me? And not only that, but in the span of today, and this workshop happened at 3 p.m., so in the span of half a day. Um, and so you begin to notice the, the specialness of those little mundane moments. I think the one I said was like, the particular way um, the sun was coming in my window um, it hit and was showing uh, rainbows against my shoes. Uh, and just those little moments and thinking of specificity is a really fun exercise. Um, in terms of observing specific things, um, I also really love generative writing where you sit down in front of, um, I, did, I did this when I was creating the, the book of poems. I would go and sit down in front of one time period uh, in the Hall of Evolution. And I would write down everything 
you know, with all your senses, everything I saw, everything I smelled, and everything I thought maybe those creatures might see or smell or hear or touch, um, and using your five senses. Um, and the key there is you have to, you set yourself a timer for like 10 minutes or some ridiculously long period of time like that. And you have to write for the entire 10 minutes. So you start with the really obvious things, you know, oh, this animal is brown, it's on green grass, it probably smells like peat bog. Um, and then you start going more in depth and more speculative and more intangible and you end up with a whole list of really interesting descriptions, I think. wonderful no and that's constantly anytime i because i have been inspired to write some poetry based off of the stuff that you've done jay um and that's a really really good tip i usually will start off and it'll be something that i'm yeah excited about but i haven't ever like sat down other than in terms of like scientific observations looking at something like that so it's a really good tip to try and write poetry better um madeline also says um i loved the poetry um which is fantastic i also love the poetry jay is a great great poet um, I had a question as well, and I, you know, this is kind of a big question, um, but could you go over just some tips about like how you write poems? And I know that that's obviously like a big topic to say, just, just explain poetry, it's fine. Um, but uh, like, do, for example, do poems always have to rhyme or like what types of poems are there that people could maybe write to just kind of give them a jumping off point if they wanted to start writing poems, but they don't necessarily know how to get started? Yeah, okay. Um... So I guess, I guess in terms of like really getting started with poetry and like if it has to rhyme, uh, as I'm sure you saw in these poems, it really doesn't. Um, and in fact, most modern poetry does not rhyme. Um, I think in terms of like what is a, a poem and like how I define like poem as opposed to prose, especially in poems like my list poem that don't necessarily have traditional poem format, is poems I think are really focused on the sound and the feel of the words, as well as the emotions and intangible things they carry, where prose is more concerned with facts and carry, conveying a narrative. Not that, of course, poems can't convey facts or prose can't convey emotions. It's a, it's a spectrum. And there's lots of gray area in the middle that could be considered either. Um, and in terms of writing poems, um, my process is very different depending on the type of poem I'm writing. Poems like these um, start with a catalyst of, that's a really interesting thing, I wanna learn more about it. Um, and the research, uh, and then just starting to write down uh, the facts that I found particularly interesting and how they connect and what sort of to the emotions that I'm feeling. Um, so like, uh, so like the Tectelic uh, poem, you know, I was really feeling like, how many ch different choices happen and different circumstances happen to lead to this, like what seems inevitable, but really like is so many different places. So poems like that, like research is the start. Um, other poems start as processing. Um, so uh, how I, like I came to poetry because I was a, a college student, um, scared and feeling a lot of things and it was my way of processing um and so just finding ways to those start with an emotion or a situation and finding a way to ex fully open that and explore it and how to represent that in a way that is both still authentically me and others can understand uh, and that's where like the metaphors and the very specific like situations that you can describe come in. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. I think, and I mean, obviously, if uh, people have other thoughts, they can they can leave them in the chat. But I think no, it's a really great kind of introduction. Um, and what has been helpful for me just from the the time that I spent with you on different projects and stuff is just knowing that there's not really a wrong way to do poetry that it's just writing what you feel and what interests you and you know just just like we were talking about different things that you observe um that it's just yeah you, you're writing what you feel and if you've done that you did it correctly 
um, and you just wrote down what you felt. And that's really good. Um, sometimes I notice too, for some of your different poems that you've done in like the fossil booklet, for instance, um, they obviously have different feelings to them. So there's different emotions. Like we were talking about Loxolophus is kind of just a cute little raccoon looking animal. And so um, does the type of poem that you would write um, usually kind of reflect like what you're talking about? So like, because Loxolophus is kind of fun, it's a limerick or like if, you know, something's a little bit more heavy, it might be, you know, a different, a different style. Sometimes, yeah. Um... Sometimes. I think I also really like to play with um, re like contrasting those things as well. Um, so like the, the cockroach poem is, I guess it, it also is cute and small and insignificant little cockroach, but that insignificant little cockroach blown up to those big, big emotions. And I find it really interesting to have, obviously the vessel, if the vessel matches the emotion, uh, it is a nice seamless transition. But I also love the tension if the vessel really doesn't match the emotion. There's that tension there. And it, it can be hard to do right. But when you have that tension, it's just such a more interesting, complex, layered project um, that I find really fascinating. So it depends, I think. Yeah. No, that's a great answer. No, and it's definitely with the cockroach poem too. You feel that, that it, you look at a cockroach before and I've, not that I would ever kill a cockroach anyway, I always take bugs outside because they're our friends and they do great things for us. But, you know, I've definitely thought twice when I see a bug and I think about all the, the evolutionary history that it has now based off that poem. Um, but yeah, um, does anyone have any other questions that they're leaving? Um, oh, there was also a comment that was from Francisco a while ago that said, hi, Jay, uh, Stephen Jay Gold would have loved your poetry, which is a huge compliment, um, which is super cool. And I also agree. Um, and then Aram left another comment that said, um, I like how you infuse some humor or play in poems and contrast is useful too, but play silliness helps readers connect. It's like permission to enjoy poetry and the content. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I, I think people get scared away from poetry a lot because like in high school, you know, you read the very structured like sonnets and like the really formal like do not go gentle into that good night and heavy and like I think I think a lot of the fun and the play gets like scared out of people. Um, but poet to me, poetry is all about play and experimentation um, and trying things and what happens happens and yeah I think yeah that permission to enjoy poetry I think especially with how poetry is taught early on is so important to bring back into the form. Yeah for sure no and it's um yeah it's just really fantastic um so if anybody has any other questions you guys can feel free to leave them we'll we'll still be hanging out for a little bit but I just wanted to do a little plug for uh for some of Jay's poetry as well obviously we've shared some of it and they shared it um in the the chat box um but it is also available online at the msu museum's website or at least it will be if it isn't currently available um we've been redesigning some of our web pages and adding some new things so we have uh some virtual tours of the museum that you guys can take and one of them is a poetry tour that that highlights uh jay's jay's poems um, so you can feel free to read those. They also have the pictures associated with them. And then once the museum reopens, I actually have a copy of the Fossil Poetry Booklet right here with me. Um, these are always available right next to our Hall of Evolution. Um, and this is the, the booklet that we created for National Fossil Day. I believe it was last year, was it two years ago? Uh, been going on for so long. Yeah, I think it was, it was at some point in the last couple of years. Um, but so you can always read through the poems. It shows you where you can kind of maybe read the poems for the most impact next to the fossils. It has a little map of the Hall of Evolution. Um, so you can always go through and enjoy those poems in the museum anytime you guys are there in person, which is really fun. For sure. Yeah. Well, we're waiting for questions on that note. I'll throw up that um, screen share that I said I was going to do and then didn't. Um, about uh, the contact information for everybody. Alrighty. There we are. So uh, feel free to keep asking asking questions and or you know sharing your comments on I don't know how you create and that sort of thing. Uh, but here's this as well. <laughs> yeah. No, and uh, and I know we've been harking on about it too, but I can tell you guys one of the first poems that I ever wrote about fossils was about fossilized poop, 
which is just, you never know where inspiration is going to come from. So uh, copper lights are uh, poop fossils, basically, that we find that uh, show all sorts of cool stuff uh, that we can learn from fossils. And so you never know where inspiration is going to come from. It could come from some, some really cool, amazing dinosaur fossil, or it could come from the lowliest of places. Um, Madeline says bye. But yeah, I think if nobody has any other questions, um, unless you have anything else, Jay, I think we can kind of wrap up. Um, but this has been super, super fun. Um, I hope everybody else has enjoyed our little uh, trek into fossil poetry as well. Um, feel free to check everything out that, that Jay's done at those links, and then also check out the, the fossil tour on our website. Um, this video will be archived um, on our YouTube channel, and then also uh, you should be able to view it on our website, actually on that fossil poetry page is the plan. Um, anytime you want to rewatch this, and you can also check out all of the other great videos we've done for our National Fossil Day virtual event um, on our YouTube channel. We have talks with MSU paleontologists. So you can learn about how uh, the Upper Peninsula used to be covered in volcanoes, or you can learn about how MSU researchers are going up to the Arctic Ocean and finding all sorts of cool fossil sharks. Um, there's also fossil crafts and uh, some introductions to fossil identification and just all sorts of cool fun stuff. So you can feel free to check those out as well. But thank you so much for joining us, Jay. And thank you so much for, for everybody here joining us. Um, it's been really fantastic. And I hope you guys all have a great weekend. All right. Bye. <laughs>